we are back. Mm. Uh, amazingly, uh, the uh, Avengers Endgame still has not crept past mm. uh, Avatar. Not they, even it, with that little sneaky thing they did. Yeah, with, with well, the it, 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 that really that kicked him up. That kicked him up, and uh, and tying in with Spider Man mm. uh, t- kicked him up a little bit. But you know, it's it's a screen availability thing. Yeah. Because the and then they also announced it's coming out on Blu-ray and 4K at the end of the month, so you know it's people are waiting. Why, but, why are people going to spend that money? Yeah. But but it's uh, it'll get there. It'll get there. The fact that you know people forget Avatar was a was a winter release and it had all of January, February, and half of March to just kind of run. Yeah. And uh, Avengers Endgame stepped into a very crowded summer. Yeah, although, a few although, weeks. although 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 everything tanked, it's not yeah. like screen availability. All, yeah. all the screens, the Dark Phoenix. You might have thought and, beyond and, gone, yeah, yeah. MIB what, yeah. three gone. Yeah, uh, you think those screens would be available? And then, but the other thing is that you got Disney films like Aladdin, mm. Toy Story four, mm-hmm. and Lion King. Yeah, which have all those screens locked up, and Disney's not going to give up any of those screens for for Endgame. Yeah. So I mean, it'll get there, but it's gonna it's uh, it's creeping along. <laughs> Anyway, well, we're going to dive right into it. Uh, start with some docs, and then we got television, and then we have a whole host of classic movies, Criterions, and uh, and Twilight Time, and Warner Archive, and a lot of fun stuff. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna dive right into it. Oh boy! Uh, starting off, um, a really interesting Virgil Films doc here called "We Are Columbine," and. Uh, this is specifically going into f- the the stories of four people who were uh, survivors of Columbine in 1999, wow. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. So they're they're adults now. They're not kids. They have lives, and um, they have some perspective on it. And it, so this is looking back. This is a it's a pretty brisk doc. It's not trying to be comprehensive. It's not sort of trying to say. Now that we are 20 years past Columbine, this is what it means. This is what we've learned. This is what needs to change. It's not doing that, and it shouldn't. It's uh, it's about 70, 75 minutes long, and it and it gets into it. Just it wants you to 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 personalize some of these human stories that were a part of the uh, of the tragedy, yeah. and and there are other stories too, and it acknowledges that, and it leaves room for that, and it leaves room for for debate, and it really wants to sort of be a, a conversation starter more than anything else. But it's um, it's actually quite good. Uh, then we got a couple from PBS, uh, both of them excellent, both of them war-centric. Uh, the first is a front line, the trial of Ratko Mladic. Ratko Mladic, one of the uh, war criminals, otherwise known as the Butcher of Bosnia, from the uh, the Bosnian War uh, that took place in the mid-1990s, and uh, early and mid-1990s. And uh, this goes into his trial, which I didn't realize took five years. Yeah. A five-year trial? Yeah. I mean, that's... I don't know what you know. Yeah, that's just. Yeah. I mean, but it's really it's quite interesting if you, if because you compare it to say the the uh, the uh, uh, Nuremberg trials. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, which which was yeah, boom yeah. in a yeah. heartbeat. So uh, anyway, this is this is very very interesting. You learn a lot about um, what war crimes tribunals are. They're very different. It's not like a regular criminal trial. There's a there are a lot of the the, the thresholds, the, the the laws, the uh, the rules, the international laws that apply, the rules of court. Uh, what you have access to, what you don't, how where, how testimony is gathered, all that stuff is really very very interesting. So um, this is another absolutely superb front line. It's about two hours long. Uh, we've also got Korea, the never ending war, and uh, this of course is a topic of conversation again. And you know now that North Korea is kind of on the grid with international relations again, and Kim Jong Un is is you know having powwows with uh, Donald Trump. So uh, this revisits, and John Cho narrates this, by the way, which is perfect. It's just, it's really, really great. Uh, so this sort of revisits the war, how it started, and uh, goes on to primarily focus on what the war has meant since 1953 when the, uh, when the ceasefire took place. And of course, the war still hasn't ended. They're, yeah, they're still it's still technically they're still technically at war. Um, can't imagine in twenty fifty three they'll probably still be at war. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got uh, Invisible Hands from First Run Features. Um, uh, Invisible Hands is uh, by a filmmaker named Shrisi Tandon. Shrisi Tandon. I hope I'm not destroying her name. I apologize in advance if uh, if I am. 
And uh, this is all about child labor and trafficking um, in in the in between the seams of international commerce. So you know, for example, we. We, we we know that okay blood diamonds right if you if you know diamonds very often have child labor yeah. uh, somewhere behind the chains nike sneakers somewhere yeah. there might be child labor involved um now we're learning too that you know your electric car the um uh, the the uh, precious earths in yeah. the batteries of your electric car mined are by, mined by yeah, children yeah. somewhere right and so so people are just panicking now over the fact that they're, they're like is there anything that isn't exploiting a child somewhere in the world down the supply line yeah and how do you know that's where this gets into um and uh, that's why when you go to like for like whole foods market for example they will have certain fruits and vegetables tagged so that you know that these come from independent farmers somewhere as opposed to a giant conglomerate that might be exploiting a local yeah, farmer. Yeah, yeah, so that, you know, we've, we've cut out the, 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 many of the, the, the guilty parties. So um, anyway, Shreisi Tandon, former journalist, and knows this material very, very well, working with uh, Charles Ferguson, the Oscar-winning uh, filmmaker as well. And uh, they interview all these all the people who know all about this stuff, and they, and they really get into the nitty-gritty of it. And it's very, very good, and it's very informative. And it'll if if you know you want to try to hone your choices in in what you buy and from whom and what companies, then you'll you know you'll uh, it, it'll it'll help you get there. Um, then we've also got two more, just two more. Uh, the most dangerous year is a uh, an unfortunately not very balanced uh, documentary that deals with a group of, um, well, it, it takes place primarily uh, around the, um, a single state and it's uh, it, on legislation that might impact families that have transgender children. So this looks at a number of those families who are sort of pleading their case and saying, don't pass this legislation. And uh, unfortunately, it really doesn't uh, present two sides. This is, a, this is a straight up advocacy cinema piece uh, from the point of view of these people. And so, you know, it's basically a, 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 a lengthy proposition campaign commercial. Um, some, you know, compelling stories here, but, but nothing, um, nothing that's going to convince anybody who isn't already convinced and nothing that probably won't play just as strongly to the other side. This, this could just as easily be a campaign commercial for the people that they oppose. So mm. that's part of the problem with advocacy cinema very often is that by virtue of omitting a point of view, Mm. You are kind of handing the opponent something to run with. I, I, it, look, uh, all, all the way back to the early days of uh, of, of M- Michael Moore. Yeah, and before him too. But yeah. but he was b- because that film Roger and Me was so successful. True, and and it, it it completely changed the dynamic of what we used to call documentary filmmaking. Yeah, that I've always said this. And I'm and by the way, you know, I'm a, I'm yeah. a big old progressive uh, yeah. like Michael and all that. The, our politics are about the same. He has never made a documentary. No, not never. one, not, not ever, not in his whole life. Nope. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and what he does is what he does. And but but it's not documentary filmmaking. No. It's not. And and you know, I I always reference the Maisleys uh, yeah. on things like this. The Maisleys would let the material just kind of speak for itself, and they're yeah. not they're not going to editorialize. They're not going to comment on it. You like this person, you hate this person. That's fine. As That's close good. to fly on the wall as they could possibly be, and as and as much un, un, uh, discovery of information from whatever it comes yeah. from about the subject as they could find. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. Yeah. And then the last one here: Eternity has no door of escape. Encounters with outsider art. Um, this is one of those docs. This is from Icarus, Icarus uh, Home Video, and um, this is one of those docs where you have to applaud somebody because normally, if you're a documentary filmmaker, you look at the the economics of your business and you think. Okay, I would love to make a documentary about the most obscure thing that I'm passionate about, mm. but maybe five people might see it, and it's going to cost me uh, who yeah. knows how many thousands of dollars of my own money and years of my own time that I don't have because i got to pay rent and, and pay a mortgage and feed a family and do whatever else you got to do. Mm. So those stories wind up never getting told, uh, uh, except in cases like this. Uh, where somebody somehow found the money and found the the resources and was able to to go and kind of delve into a really really kind of a fringe topic that nobody else will probably ever ever deal with again, uh, and uh, this basically uses it as its central launching point the Gotardo Art Gallery uh, in Switzerland and a very very specific exhibition there 
that uh, deals with uh, what is known as art brut, uh, which means outsider art. And uh, there's a whole, this is a whole different class of art. It's a very specific subculture of art that is kind of where surrealism intersects with, um, I don't know, with, with uh, kind of protest art, with uh, avant-gardism. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really very interesting and specific uh, school of art and, uh, and art philosophy. And uh, they talked to a lot. They, they talked to a lot of people. I mean, this must have taken a lot of time to gather these people together, get their interviews, and uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, Eternity has no door of escape. Encounters with arts outsider art. Um, so it's a wonderful, wonderful doc about uh, some otherwise overlooked stuff. Mm. All right, uh, TV. Let's yeah, dive into yeah, TV. I'll, I'll some... do these big box sets Knock first, yeah. uh, just because they're super duper interesting. Uh, the first one being Trial and Retribution, uh, a British crime drama series. It was just fantastic. This series began that back in the '90s, like '97 or so. Uh, David David Heyman in the series. What it did is more or less what what they do on uh, I, th- I think Law and Order. Um, they follow a crime uh, from the discovery of whatever the crime is, usually a murder, uh, yeah. completely through the process of uh, bringing charges to someone, and then follow that completely through the judicial process, Terrific. right down to the verdict. And the thing of it is, you, you don't always know what the verdict is going to be in these, uh, and sometimes the verdicts don't go the way that, uh, that you think that they would go. Uh, and I think that the ti- I always thought that the title of this series was interesting, too. Uh, it wasn't called uh, um, uh, Trial and Justice. It was called called trial and retribution. Mm. That tells you where the mindset yeah. is yeah. Of, of, of these particular filmmakers. I got to tell you, this stuff was so good. Sometimes you felt like you were watching true stories. They're not. Yeah. There's, this is, it's a scripted series, but that's how good the writing was in this series. Then we got on both DVD and in blue on Blu-ray, uh, Gotham, uh, the, yeah. the complete series. You know what? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this series, and I've watched it all. So uh, Luke... Our good friend Luke Y. Thompson, colleague uh, of ours who writes a lot about this stuff, a nerdist and, and about comics and big Comic-Con guy. So Luke is of the opinion, and again, I haven't watched all of Gotham. I've watched a lot of it, but I haven't watched all of it. Uh, Luke is of the opinion that this is the best Batman there is, the best Batman story. Beats all the movies, beats all the, uh, all the TV series, animated, everything else. Luke's, Luke thinks that Gotham basically is where it all comes together. Mm. You agree? Well, uh, this is all sort of, sort of super-duper foundational. Yeah. It's, it's true to the theme uh, of Batman. I'll yeah. give it that. I buy this kid in that role yeah. of, of, of Bruce Young Wayne. Young Bruce Wayne, yeah. Now, it, 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 it goes off in a couple of different directions, though. Uh, Barbara Gordon and who she is, yeah, uh, and and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it can't, it really can't reconcile itself into the Batmans that we know. No, it lives. It's a different, it's yeah. a different approach. They're all different universes, yeah. basically, kind of yeah. different universes. Yeah. So, so, it's, so you know, it sort of depends on what you mean. But you know, it's very watchable, and I, you know, I enjoy it a great deal. Yeah. So I'll give him that. I'll give yeah. him that. My favorite Batman. I'm sorry, Tim Burton, Michael Keaton. You <laughs> me the hell out of here, man. <laughs> Jack Nicholson. I'm yes. still a Christian Bale guy. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Christian Bale guy. Uh, uh, Criminal, Ni- Criminal Minds season one, yep. uh, with over fifty minutes worth of special features and all kinds of behind the scenes stuff and deleted scene stuff. And uh, it's it's a really, if you're a fan of Criminal Minds, never watched that series much. I must admit, a like Criminal Minds. And now the one, now oh, the one man. that we are so excited about. Uh, so the complete series, uh, Space 1999, all forty eight episodes on uh, Blu-ray. On Blu-ray, it's just really, really fantastic. All kinds of brand new stuff, new interviews with cast and crew, and audio commentaries, and uh, you know, vintage featurettes. And, and and I just want to say, this is this is this is exactly why we love Shout Factory because Shout Factory will will pick up the baton where others have left it. You yeah. know what is what people have groused about for a long time. Space 1999 came out years ago from A and E Home Entertainment. Yeah, DVD, when A and E when A and E was still a, a thing. When A and E Home Entertainment was a thing, and uh, and then they came out with the first season on Blu-ray, mm-hmm. and that was it. There was never a second season on Blue. Uh. They never came out with a second season on Blu-ray. You had to you buy a British import if you. And wanted. that was still A and E. It was still A and E. Okay, they just they did what the, what so many shows have done, and that was they put it out, and there wasn't sort of enough heat on it, and they figured, man, screw it, you mm. know, forget the second season. And you're like, no, come on, yeah. we, why do if you're gonna do that, then put the whole thing out. See, they were being greedy, right? They were yeah. thinking, oh, we'll put the first season out, and then we'll you know then we'll get them to pay double dip for the second season. 
and then the first season didn't sell well enough, and now, well, now, now you regret not putting the second season out. So yeah. don't do that. Yeah, you're yeah. screwing people you, over. Yeah, yeah, and you screwed yourself too. You know, it's lame. Yeah, so, but so no, lame. this is this is just so great to have uh, sp- finally a proper Blu-ray set of Space 1999. It's which a gorgeous is, box too. I just love it. The, the red, white, and that sort of powder blue, uh, and you know, uh, and, and a, you know, a fantastic series this was. It, it's it got it a little is, spacey toward the latter. Well, the second season was, you know, there were a lot of things that happened between the first and the second season. Not just changing the theme song, but it was there was a there was a, well for a, for starters, Jerry Anderson, Anderson and Sylvia Anderson mm. started fighting and eventually got a divorce. Yeah. So the divorce happens kind of in that in that scene. Yeah. And uh, same and, thing happened to Martin Landau and Barbara. Uh, yes. Barbara Bain. Yeah. 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 And and uh, they changed the tone of the show. They obviously got rid of Barry Morse and they brought on Maya. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So you get rid of Victor. You now you, and you get Maya. And then they introduced uh, the whole. Then Tony and Maya have their thing. They figured they needed a better romance since yeah. you know yeah. Landau and Bain weren't bringing <laughs> yeah. it. And so it became. And then there, every week was some bug-eyed monster yeah. that you know invaded. And then Maya had to turn. And they into were the plainly monster. sort of biting that at. at at Star Trek at yes. that point, you know, yeah. in, in terms of the sort of he, he and, became he became sort of an action guy. Yeah, and, and and they needed to stick with what they were for the first season, which was very much his own show. This sort of metaphysical, weird, yeah. you know, space is weird, and it was very different from Star I mean, Trek. He, Koenig was a he was a thinking guy. He didn't grab a gun and go punch people in the <laughs> no, face. He was not Kirk. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Oh, well. A uh, couple more? Yeah, hit those and uh, I'll do these. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do is uh, uh, Johnny Quest, uh, the complete original series. Dude, 1964. Crazy, right? I, it, it, well, for one thing, in this series, uh, and, I, and I think for a while this went away in like the early 80s because people, and they, and they had that new sort of modern mm-hmm. Johnny Quest. Because mm-hmm. you couldn't, you, there's a lot of stuff you can't do anymore. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Quest uh, had, would, would have had a, has a carbine. In the opening credits of this series, and he's and he's just cranking with this. He's four, what is he twelve in this series or something oh, like? Oh, it's it, it's nuts. Yeah, yeah, it's, be like you know, he's, he's just he's cranking with this carbine. and kills like six guys in a boat. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like and and and, and, uh, and race is like good shooting, Johnny. Yeah, <laughs> it's like oh no, you can't yeah. you can't do any of that anymore. No. I loved Johnny Quest. I don't think you can do the Haji thing the way they do it Not in the original series anymore. Not anymore. Although, I, I want to point out, uh, that bugs me a little bit because, A, Haji was as smart, if not smarter, than Johnny Quest. Yeah. Uh, and it, just as ca- capable in every possible way. Yeah. Uh, and, and Haji sounded like a person well, from India. What the hell is wrong with actually sounding this like is, the nation that you're from? I don't get that. This is, this is one of these things where I think a lot of people do overreact through political political correctness to things that were not only of their moment, Mm -hmm. but which were also quite progressive for their moment. And one of those, in that vein, is when I listen to uh, uh, all the old uh, Jack Benny shows with Rochester. Yeah, yeah. Now, people are like, oh, that's such a step and fetch it uh, uh, caricature. But but no. No, you're not Rochester, Rochester... Is the smart one. Smart he's, one, yes. He, Rochester always has Jack Benny on the ropes. He's telling him the truth. Mm-hmm. He's telling him when he's being stingy. And the only person who ever acts with common sense is Rochester. Rochester, yes. You're missing it. You're missing you, it. You're missing the whole you point know, of that. It's, uh, it's, uh, and I remind people all the time as people talk about, you know, you go all the way back to Hattie McDaniel. Yeah. Uh, and people talk about Hattie McDaniel. Like, first of all, black folks at the time in 1939, I think yeah. it was, that Hattie won that Oscar for that role, were very proud of Hattie McDaniel, who lived here in Los Angeles. She won. An, she won. An, she, uh, uh, she uh, yeah. won other awards. She won an NAACP the award. award. We, yeah. She was beloved. So, oh, yeah. and then I remind people: if you pay attention to the movie, the black woman decides what the white girl is going to do. <laughs> it's true. She decides. I decide yeah. what you're going to wear. I decide when you're going to take a bath. I decide who you're going to be in this room yeah. with. I decide. I just she, the black woman. And Selznick was, was <laughs> Selznick was very conscious about that yeah. too. She, she's she's running the whole damn thing. The, yeah. the, 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 but you know yeah. anyway. Any anyway, lots and lots of special features on this Johnny Quest original series Blu-ray. Fantastic stuff. I love it. Uh, I'm going to hit a few here. Uh, the Old Man of the Sea with Anthony Quinn, uh, television production. Uh, not the movie. 1990. Uh, that one. Was this was 1990. Yeah. So this is not this is not the Spencer Tracy movie by any stretch. The the which is still kind of the standard, even though it's not that faithful. Um, this is this is more faithful, but doesn't have quite the same production value. This is from S'more Entertainment. 
But here's the thing. Anthony Quinn really is the better Santiago. Yeah. And he and it, and it's it, you, I sort of wish I could have taken Anthony Quinn and no offense to Spencer Tracy, but I wish I could take Anthony Quinn's performance and drop it into that Spencer Tracy movie. Yeah. yeah you know. Yeah. Um so despite the fact that this is uh this, this it still isn't quite there, quite isn't uh where you want the story to be, um at least in terms of uh, production value. Anthony Quinn is terrific. Yeah, and I Patricia, remember watching that movie in 1990. It, I do too. Young Patricia Clarkson, young yeah, Gary yeah. Cole. Yeah, uh, in that movie, I thought it was really good. Yeah, it's uh, he 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 really owns it, and and that's what makes it great. So um, you know, it's still very much a TV movie of its period, but boy, Anthony Quinn is terrific. And then we got a couple from PBS here, uh, Les Misérables from Masterpiece. So this is Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, um, not a musical version of it. And uh, this was done for British television and is quite good. Uh, i got to be honest. It, it's, it's better than I expected it to be. And I've always been a huge fan of the, uh, the old one with Tony Perkins from 1980, what was that, 83, 82, something like that. Uh, that was the one that I always kind of focused on, and uh, and this really compares very, very favorably. It was written by Andrew Davies, who did Pride and Prejudice, and uh, has a terrific has a terrific cast. I mean, a really terrific cast. Lily Collins is wonderful. Dominic West is is great. David Oyelowo shows up in this as well. Olivia Coleman, the Oscar winner um, from The Favorite. Uh, it's it's just a it's a beautiful beautiful rendering of it and it is on Blu-ray and uh, has a couple of extras on it as well. It's got an introduction to the story uh, and some featurettes and and that's really kind of all you need. So it's a Blu-ray of a new PBS British television Les Misérables. Oh man! And then the second season of Frankie Drake Mysteries. If uh, anybody has been following that, this is uh, you know not the greatest British mystery show. It's uh, it's it takes place in Toronto. We should point out when I say British, I'm talking about British Empire. I mm. can, I include Australia, New Zealand, and Canada in the British TV realm. And this is uh, so in terms of British mystery and all of its all of its um, uh, Commonwealth. Uh, acolytes. Mm. The um, this is not better than anything that you would normally get, but it's you know the fact that it takes place in Toronto in the 1920s is interesting, and um, so you know um, you're dealing with female detectives. That's interesting. So I mean there is something to it, and uh, it's made a second season. Presumably it'll make a third as well. So there it is. What else? Indeed. Okay, so uh, volume two of the 1940s, Popeye the Sailor, uh, 15 color theatrical shorts. This, this stuff is just so wonderful. I, I grew up sort of watching those 60s Popeye the Sailors. Yep. This stuff is so much better. Uh, the, the color is so much more vibrant. The, uh, yeah. It, the, the, yeah. Look, it's just it's better animation. It is. Uh, studio, the studio animation that they were doing in the 40s as opposed to the television stuff that they were doing in the 60s. So this is just really, really wonderful. 15 uncut cartoons, never before released, uh, mastered from the original Technicolor Cinecolor uh, masters there. Heart Guy from Acorn Television, Heart Guy Series 1, 2, and 3. Uh, this is a pretty neat little series set in Australia about an arrogant heart surgeon. Uh, who uh, has a bad night with some uh, alcohol and drugs and, gets, <laughs> and, and, uh, and is, can no longer be an arrogant heart surgeon, has to go back to his hometown and just sort of practice as a GP. Uh, with his with his mom and his dad and all the all it's, it's the another one of those you know. it's another one of those uh, uh, northern exposure northern variations. exposure sort of variation yeah. exactly Doc Hollywood kind of thing but you know what it's it's sort of Doc Hollywood yeah, yeah that's right yeah. it sort of feels kind of great yeah. and uh, baseball baseball's greatest picture so this is the Dick Cavett show a three DVD set of him doing nothing but talking to baseball pictures of yore uh, a Whitey Ford Bob Feller Dizzy Dean. So look, Mickey Mantle. If you're if you're a baseball Tommy John, if you're after whom they named the surgery, if you're a baseball fan, watching Dick Cavett talk to these guys, uh, you know, sixties, seventies, uh, I guess on up until the eighties, this goes, and it's just it's just really 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 great. For one thing, you know what they hardly ever talk about? Hmm. Baseball. <laughs> they talk <laughs> politics. They talk yeah, 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 male female. You name it, they talk about it. But Dick Cavett, being who he is. Uh, and, and of course, Dick Cavett is a baseball fan, by the way. It's not that he couldn't talk baseball, and they did talk baseball. But but mostly, they strayed into the realms of conversation that you only got from Dick Cavett back in the day. And it's a really, really, really wonderful one to check out. Uh, baseball's greatest hits: the pictures, Dick Cavett show. 
All right, we're going to hit uh, for the rest of the show. Rest of the show, we're going to talk about some classic movies. And I'm going to start with a bunch of amazing Criterions that we, we have this uh, this week. What a, I mean, Criterion just constantly keeps knocking it out of the park. We keep saying that. And you just, I, I marvel at the amazing things they come out with. Because it's always a mix of, well, of course, we were going to get that on Criterion. And stuff where you go, oh, I, what an interesting choice. What a mm, totally mm. interesting left field choice. And that left field choice this week is The Baker's Wife. A lot of people thinking, The Baker's Wife? What the hell is The Baker's Wife? Why does that get the criterion treatment? So here's why. The the famous French author, Marcel Pagnol, mm. who, of course, wrote Jean de Florette and Manon of the Spring and, and Fanny and a lot, you know, all of these wonderful, wonderful pastoral stories that define the Provence region of France. And he was a regional uh, artist. Mm -hmm. Pagnol wrote about that region around Marseille and Avignon and and right there on the, the Mediterranean coast and life down there. And and he, he really... He, he elevated those people, those simple uh, provincial people and, and their lives and, and uh, articulated it and recorded it in ways that nobody else ever has. And if you've seen Jean de Florette, you know that this is just, you know, magnificent stuff. Well, Pagnol was also a filmmaker. He was the first person to actually adapt many of his own novels into stories. Mm -hmm. The original Manon of the Spring was, was one of his uh, the, the Marseille trilogy was, was uh, something he's very famous for. One of the films that is lesser known is The Baker's Wife from 1938, which is, a, an, again, a just it's a beautiful look at this small provincial village in Provence, uh, the south of France, and uh, centering basically around um, a baker and his wife. And it, it, in that way, it's a little bit like Marty. It's mm -hmm, sort of like mm -hmm. a French version, a French provincial version of Marty. And the actor who plays the baker... Uh, is Raimu, who was a famous, famous actor of the of the time, was really not uh, ever a thing in Hollywood or in the United States. Mm -hmm. But um, Orson Welles was a huge admirer of him, and many other people just praised Raimu, really a, a very, very famous actor of the day. And he is wonderful here. And I can't compare it to anything else other than Marty. It is sweet and funny and affecting, and it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. Like most Pagnol films, it's also long. It's over two hours long. So you have to get used to the pace. It's a very, very deliberate pace. But what a sweet, wonderful movie, The Baker's Wife from 1938 on Criterion Blu-ray uh, from Marcel Pagnol. The, uh, the of course, this is going to be on Blu-ray from Criterion this week is uh, Fassbinder's, uh, oh, yes. the, the legendary Fassbinder trilogy of the, Mar the, the BRD trilogy, Marriage of Maria Braun, Veronica Voss, and Lola. Um, all of these are absolutely superb films. They are all legendary films. They are all masterpieces, and uh, you, you you just have to own this. If you're if you are any kind of a, a cinephile, this must be on your on your shelf. It has been out on DVD previously. It has never been out on Blu-ray. It is out finally on Blu-ray. Um, and the Marriage of Maria Braun is arguably the one that is the greatest of these. If you have to sort of rank them, uh, that's something that a lot of us studied the screenplay for in school. It is in extraordinary script and uh i remember you know in in, in one of my classes we like marking that script up and yeah. you know the things that he does in it and and the tricks that he does to to move the story into really interesting directions um and the way that this sort of defines the new german cinema that fassbinder and vim fenders and herzog and so many others were a part of in the aftermath of the oberhausen manifesto where they were sort of revolting against um, the, the, uh, the tropes and the traditions of, uh, of uh, what German cinema had been prior to the 1960, mm -hmm. late 60s and early 70s. Tons of extras here that'll just blow your mind uh, on and on and on and on. There are audio commentaries that were originally recorded in 2003 featuring Wim Wenders and Michael Ballhaus and Tony Raines um, and on and on. Tons of interviews with uh, actors and actresses in the film, including Hannah Scheigele, Who's just, who's just magnificent in uh, Marriage of Maria Braun in particular. Uh, in, uh, other interviews from 2003 with cinematographer uh, Xaver Schwarzenberger and screenwriter. Uh, I mean, on and on. There's, a, there's a, even a feature-length documentary from 1992 uh, about uh, Fassbender that I had never seen before, which wow. is just... It, 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 what a tempestuous life and career and such a genius and such a tormented genius. Uh, all of this stuff is just, it's so rich. Three movies and then like two movies worth of, or three movies worth of additional extras. It's the BRD trilogy. It is, you know, it's a, you've got to have it. Uh, Europa Europa from Agnieszka Holland. 
otherwise known as simply Europa, when it was uh, Oscar-nominated. Uh, the story of a uh, young Jewish man, played by Marco Hofschneider, young Jewish uh, boy, basically, who um, has to f- figure out how to not be arrested and sent to a concentration camp uh, and uh, basically goes through an elaborate ruse to pretend that he is not Jewish. And uh, it is quite a fascinating story based in truth and really uh, done beautifully by Agnieszka Holland. Might be her best film. And uh, this gets a great video essay from uh, Annette Insdorf, who is always wonderful, wonderful to listen to and to watch. Um, also has an interview with Solomon Perel, who wrote the book that this is based on. So it is technically his story. He wrote an autobiography. I, I, I'm, I've never been quite sure where the autobiography leaves off and the movie picks up, but there is, he does certainly discuss some of that in the interview. I wish he discussed it a little bit more. And then there are new interviews with Anishka Han and Marco Hofschneider, who's quite a bit older now, and the original 2008 uh, Agnieszka Holland commentary as well. So uh, Europa Europa on Blu-ray. And then our last uh, Criterion Blu-ray of the week uh, I want to talk about because of the year that it came out. Uh, this is Clute from 1971. Uh, now, Clute is really uh, just... I, I can't believe we haven't had a Blu-ray of this on Criterion yet. Alan, Alan Pakula's film that... Uh, features that absolutely amazing performance uh, by Jane Fonda as the prostitute, an incredible, equally incredible performance by Donald Sutherland. Um, Really a great film in every conceivable way. Uh, Alan Pakula, you know, All the President's Men might be the only other film that sort of compares with this. But here's the thing. And and great extras. Let me just get into it, too. It, this is uh, Blu-ray from a new 4K digital transfer that overseen by Michael Chapman, the great cinematographer. Uh, there's a new interview with Jane Fonda conducted by Ileana Douglas, which is wonderful and really insightful. And uh, there's even a new little mini documentary that's all about the film and Alan J. Pakula. Um, new interviews, a short documentary that they made during the shooting of the film, basically like the original EPK. All this stuff is great. But here's the thing. 1971 uh, is one of the epic years in movie history. We don't often talk about it, but 1971 didn't just give us Clute. It gave us Clockwork Orange. It gave us Fiddler on the Roof. It gave us The Emigrants. It, it gave us uh, so many extraordinary movies. It just blows your mind. Just look at the Oscar-nominated films from that year alone. Uh, it gave us Shaft. Uh, yeah. You know, on and on and on. 1971 was an amazing movie year. It's just breathtaking. Everything that came out that year is yeah. through the roof. Uh, 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 you know, it's really, it's just you can go and go on the onto the internet, do a Google on 1971 Oscars, and look at the films that were nominated for Academy Awards in 1971. It'll it'll freak you out. You won't believe it. It's like 30 or 40 classics just that were nominated for Oscars. And once you blow that out to the films that were not Oscar nominated. Forget about it. It was about every week you were getting a masterpiece or two all year long. And what a what an amazing year it was. So Clute is hopefully the beginning of many, uh, the first of many great 1971 films that will uh, will soon be coming out on, on Blu-ray. What else we got? Uh, let's see. Uh, falling into the, um, I, well, I guess these are, these are classic movies, most of these, although I'm holding yeah. Major League in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> 30th anniversary for yeah, Major 1989. League. Yeah, 1989. It's the same Blu-ray. I, 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 I just, I brought it out because it's, you know, it's, hey, it's 30th Major anniversary. League. You know what? David Ward wrote and directed this film yeah. uh, back during a period when a guy could write a film yeah. and direct it. Right. Who, who, who was basically just nobody and, 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 and cast it up. It's a fun movie, though, about a sure. woman who inherits the Cleveland Indians, uh, and she wants to move into Miami, so she has to, uh, <laughs> to have a losing season. So she gets all these, what she hopes are a bunch of losers on her yeah. team. Charlie Sheen, young yeah. Charlie Sheen, and Corbin Burns, and yeah. Tom Berenger. You know, Sherman, yeah. the Wesley Snipes, yeah. Pardon this? Yeah. He, he, he read three times for that part. Really? Yeah. But Wesley oh. got, yeah, yeah, well, you know, that, well. that's what it's going to be. Interesting thing. Um, uh, and a lot of fun. So anyway, this movie, there was, I think there was a major league. It's basically league the, produ- the producers with yeah, baseball. With baseball yeah. instead. And, you know, they turn out to, they turn out to actually be uh, pretty damn good. Uh, Just Franco's Attack of the Robots. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which uh, 1966 film, which had a different title. I, 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 the, the actual the actual film had a different title. Anyway, it's about a mad scientist and his army of uh, of, of robots, and uh, it's 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 part it's part Bond because it was 1966 and everything had a little touch of Bond uh, to it uh, back then. But it's a lot of I don't know, it's a neat and classy film uh, that looks kind of cool. 
uh, I, I think anyway. Just Franco uh, in black and white French film with a few special features, including uh, the English uh, English language soundtrack and an audio commentary uh, by, uh, let's see, the author of Obsession, the films of Just Franco. Kinda yep. Cool. Yep. There. Uh, the 1924 uh, Silent Peter Pan. Oh, so good. So beautiful, uh, this, this film, um, which, uh, though it was directed by uh, a guy named um, uh, Herbert Brinton, was produced by Jesse Lasky and Adolf Zucker. Right. As executive producers, uh, and you know, and, uh, forerunners of Paramount Pictures, ex- exactly. Uh, yeah. So you know, that's 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 where the sort of lineage of this comes from. Anyway, it's an absolutely beautiful uh, little restoration of this film. It looks gorgeous. It's two K restoration uh, with a, with a new score and a commentary by uh, uh, historian Cat Ellinger and an essay and uh, an audio interview uh, interview with uh, the actress Esther Ralston. Uh, who obviously uh, was who was in the film and obviously survived long enough to do this audio interview. So you want it for that, if nothing else. Good stuff. Uh, we from Twilight Time. It's a really interesting month for Twilight Time. The uh, it's all about the women, but in in a really interesting way. So there there are sort of three classes of films that we have here between the four, and two of them belong together. And first off, we've got uh, a couple of Betty Grable movies. Now Betty Grable, for, well, the Twentieth Century Fox musicals. So Warner made musicals. Uh, MGM made crazy musicals, mm. and people often forget that, um, yeah, there were also other studios making musicals, and one of them was Fox. And Fox made some pretty darn good musicals. Betty Grable was the centerpiece of most of them, uh, most of the best, one, best ones, and they've got two of them here from Twilight Time. They went and licensed these from 20th, and thank goodness, Mother Wore Tights and Pin Up Girl. And they are both really, really fun, and they have great supporting performances as well. Uh, Pin Up Girl is the one that is probably the most famous uh, of all of them. This is from 1944, and, uh, you know, she plays a USO hostess, and, and uh, there's, there's like a, um, a dual, uh, a double life uh, storyline to it, and Joey Brown is in it, and he's, he's very, very funny, and uh, Martha Ray is in it, and she's very, very good. And, uh, but ultimately, you're, you're watching it just because Betty Grable is a totally magnetic screen presence. Mm-hmm. She's absolutely terrific, and... Uh, it's got a, a certain gloss and a sheen to it. It feels a little bit like a like a slightly lesser MGM musical, and and good on them for it. Uh, Mother wore tights is uh, slightly less known, but really no less enjoyable. Uh, also has a really really great cast, great supporting cast, and uh, this is from a few years later in 1947. Centers around directed by the great Walter Lang, by the way, who would go on to do State Fair and The King and I, and um, this is all about a um, uh, a. a a, fa- a family of uh, vaudevillians. And it's one of a number of movies that dealt with the, the world of vaudeville in the 30s and 40s because most of the people in Hollywood in the 30s and 40s who were doing musicals came from a vaudeville background. So you have a whole bunch of these, you know, uh, Gene Kelly and, uh, made, was, in a, it was in two or three, I think, even. Uh, for me and my gal, I think, kind of dealt with that as well. And um, so Mother Wore Tights is basically one of those, and there's a lot of nostalgia. You know, at that point, people are aging out of the vaudeville era, and they're looking back on it. And so these movies are very, very calculated to, to tap into that. And Mother Wore Tights is a really, really fun one. Dan Daly co-stars with her and is absolutely uh, delightful as well. Um, great score, too, from uh, Alfred Newman. Also uh, in stock at... Uh, 20th Century Fox at the time doing musicals was Alice Faye. Alice Faye was kind of the second tier to um, to Betty Grable at the time. And Twilight Time has also given us Hello Frisco, Hello, which is uh, a <laughs> 1943 uh, Alice Faye musical that is also uh, centered around the world of vaudeville, uh, specifically in uh, in San Francisco, uh, and uh, you know, kind of creating that wonderful, wonderful backdrop. And this features. Jack Oakey, who is who did a lot of shorts, uh, you know, one of the great classic comic figures in shorts at the time, has kind of disappeared. The Academy here, the Academy, the Oscar people, they have an annual lecture that they call the Jack Oakey Lecture on Comedy, mm. which uh, I think most people going to it don't even realize who Jack Oakey okay, was. Yeah. Well, Jack Oakey is real funny. He's kind of portly. He's a little bit like if Curly were not a spaz on yeah. Three Stooges, yeah. he'd be Jack Oakey. Um, little, little he's he's almost like he's physically more like Curly, but more like Larry in terms yeah. of his attitude. Anyway, really a very very sweet film and uh, other really really fun uh, performances in it from June Havoc and 
uh, Lynn Barry. It's a it's a good film, and uh, I'm glad that it's been resurrected on Blu-ray from uh, from Twilight Time. Now, here's the other Twilight Time that does not go anywhere in the league with those. I love this movie though. Written and directed by Matthew Chapman in 1980, just on the eve of Excalibur, one of my all-time favorite movies, starring Helen Mirren, Hussy. Yeah. This. Yeah. Look, it's, it's you can't even call a movie that anymore. You can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't even use that title anymore. Uh, Helen Mirren is just. I fell in love with Helen Mirren in this movie. Yeah. Is it a little dirty? Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole. That's the whole point of it. Um, she's a hussy. Yeah, and, but uh, you know what? Does, uh, but you know, look, you know. look. She's. I mean, essentially, this this was one of the first movies of the 1980s to sort of delve into. It's building on the British crime films, and it's getting you into the era of of really blue collar movies that are looking at really uh, yeah. a gritty part of London. And you know, uh, uh, Stephen Frears started making yeah. a lot of those. And, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Sammy and Rosie got laid. So a lot of the working class stuff, like Ken Loach and Mike yeah. Lee, the things yeah. that they would do, Hussey sort of anticipates a lot of that. And, yeah, she's a hooker. I'm sorry. She yeah. is She is a hooker, and she is tough, and she is awesome, and she is uh, she's great. And, but she, she the way she plays it, she's not playing it in an exploitive way. She's really playing all – she's owning it. Yeah. And it contrasts, interestingly, with Clute. Her performance in Hussey and Jane Fonda in Clute really are kind of – they're sort of cut from the same cloth, you know, an ocean apart. Yeah. And and a decade apart. So yeah. uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so Hussey starring uh, the amazing Helen Mirren and Paul Angelis and, and Murray Salem and John, John Shea. Shea and, yeah. you know, yeah, they're all in this as well. And, and Patty Belay is, is, is good in this as well. But honestly, it's it's all about Helen Mirren in 1980. Wow. Uh, I got a couple over here I'll knock yeah. off. Uh, so Blu-ray, Jennifer Jones uh, and, um, uh, and this really neat um, film, uh, The Wild Heart, Emmer Pressburger and Michael pa- Powell-directed film uh, from 1952, uh, which I – this is just a good movie. It basically, it's totally. about this gypsy girl who lives sort of like out in the, in, 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 in the wilds of the woods, and there's this – she's married to this – preacher and there's this guy that uh, that owns the land around where she is and she's just this uh, jennifer i mean she's jennifer jones and she has this sort of connection to the animals she casts these spells and and basically this guy decides he simply wants her and he's gonna have her despite the fact that he's she's married to the preacher and it's about it, it's it's again a hard time making this film as a subject again i, I think about these things like the sort of mad dog and glory kind of thing you can't have a woman and her sexuality uh, be the object of these two men making decisions about yeah. who's going to have her. I'll True. have her. I'll have her. <laughs> you know, hey, excuse me, standing here, human being standing here, maybe I'll decide he'll have me. Yeah. Nevertheless, this is a wonderful film. Powell and Emmerich Pressburger there. Thunder Bay, um, uh, a really neat and somewhat forgotten Anthony Mann film with James Stewart. It uh, is kind of, yeah. It is kind of, you know, I, I, from, 19, from 1953, Basically, uh, what you have are these uh, sort of wildcat uh, offshore oil rigger guys, uh, uh, played by um, uh, James Stewart uh, and Dan Duria in this film. Uh, and they're bumped up against these sort of Cajun shrimpers, who, of course, use that water uh, to do their fishing. And, 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 the, and they're at odds with each other, and there's a, a woman involved, obviously, um, and hurricanes and fires on the rig and, and, and sabotage. And this was really... A, a really intense sort of hardcore m- movie, and I, I'll tell you what, Jimmy Stewart is kind of the bad guy. And you don't have yeah. a whole lot of Jimmy Stewart playing the bad that's guy. True, he, he played the bad guy once or twice, but, yeah. not, but there's not a lot of yeah, times he plays the bad guy. Uh, this Island Earth from 1955, uh, just a wonderfully classic science fiction film uh, uh, about uh, aliens attempt to take over uh, to, to take over the planet. You know, this is mean, great. This is just classic stuff. I'm right? surprised it's never been remade, or that no one's ever even suggested remaking. Yeah, it because, because it, I think you know, look, but for that white hair, remember the white hair? Yeah, thing, yeah. But for that, yeah, uh, you could probably, you could probably. But if they remade the thing. Yeah, you know John Carpenter reconceptualized the thing and all kind. I mean, you could you could do a number on this island Earth. You yeah. really could, and actually come up with something sort of interesting. Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, special features include a new 4K scan of the original film element, so it looks really, really, really great, and uh, all, all kinds of stuff that they did to the sound, the new audio interview uh, with uh, film historians and uh, a couple of the filmmakers. Neat, neat stuff for this island Earth on uh, Blu-ray. You got some? 
Yeah, let me hit the uh, the Arrow stuff. So we got some uh, got two from regular Arrow, one from Arrow Academy. The Artier stuff is always on Arrow Academy. And uh, this one is lovely. I, I'd forgotten this movie even existed. Uh, Mitchell Leeson's Hold Back the Dawn, starring Charles Boyer, Olivia de Havilland, and Paulette Goddard. How's that for an all-star cast? Yeah, man. Let me say that again. Charles Boyer, Olivia de Havilland, who is 103 years old right now, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so a member of this cast is still around. Still pissing off her sister if she were around. Yeah, well, that, that was the joke, right? <laughs> yeah. That, that jo- Joan Fontaine once said, she said, you know, if I die for if I die first, Olivia will be mad because I did something else <laughs> that I did first. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, and Paulette Goddard. Uh, yeah. So this is this is really a wonderful 1941 classic uh, movie m- directed by Mitchell Leeson, but bear in, bear in mind, written by Charles Brackett and Billy Wilder. So, yes, you know, you always have to focus. And Billy Wilder wrote a lot of great stuff for other directors, uh, and, and this is one of them. And, boy, what, a, what an amazing, what an amazing script this is and what a great cast. Uh, so, so much fun. The, uh, and, and Charles Boyer is great. I mean, forget about the accent. He's playing a Romanian here. It doesn't really make any sense with the French accent. But he's, uh, he's this Romanian gigolo. This is so timely. Who who tries to get into the U.S. through Mexico, and uh, he he has to he has to wait for eight years. I can't believe how timely this is. It's 1941. Mm. It it just it's so hysterical how timely this is. So uh, and may, that may be why they even did it. Anyway, um, and uh, Paulette Goddard plays a former dancing partner of his, and uh, Olivia de Havilland is uh, th- this woman that he tries to get in with to get across the border. It's a whole border jumping thing. Anyway, it's really very very clever. Billy Wilder, of course, being an immigrant and having fled Hitler and, and come here before World War II, you know, brings a certain um, uh, understanding of the experience that is very, very clever. And uh, Olivia is great. Charles Boyer is great. I mean, it's just, uh, it's absolutely a terrific film. Hold Back the Dawn. It was big Oscar nominations in 1941. And, of course, as we know, that year was dominated by Hold, you know, How Green Was My Valley and, of course, Citizen Kane. Uh, so it kind of falls behind them a little bit. And then from Arrow Regular, a couple of uh, uh, cultier, poppier titles. The Chill Factor is uh, essentially a knockoff of The Exorcist that was one of many, many films trying to knock off The Exorcist in uh, you know pretty much throughout the 70s and 80s. There were just a ton of these. And um, it's, it's okay, I mean, for what it is. It's... Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's like The Exorcist in snow, maybe is the best way to put it, and all takes place around snowmobiling, and you know, it's I mean, it's a little cheesy, but it's at least kind of novel for its uh, for its type. So, I mean, if you're into <laughs> films of that sort, the one I really want to give a, a shout out to is The Loveless from uh, 1981. This is an old Catherine Bigelow movie with Willem Dafoe, basically her version of Brando's The Wild One. Uh, you got a, a biker gang that's uh, going th- on their way to the Daytona 500, and they go through this small town, and e- tension erupts between the biker gang and the town, basically in a Romeo and Juliet way, because Willem Dafoe uh, kind of wants to get it on with one of the women in the town, and Dad's not too happy. Lots of extras on this thing. And there, by the way, there are a lot of extras on Chill Factor as well. I just don't consider them interesting enough to recommend, but... Uh, the Loveless has a lot of really, really great extras on here, uh, including new interviews with Willem Dafoe uh, and a bunch of the other members of the cast. There's a new video that has interviews with the uh, the producers, include one of whom is A. Kipman Ho, who's done a lot of uh, Oliver Stone stuff. Uh, a new audio interview with uh, Eddie Dixon, musician who uh, who did some music for the film, and uh, it's really it's it's really really uh, it's. It's a really, really great uh, set. The Loveless. If you're, if you want to go and find an old Catherine Bigelow classic, she technically has the co-writing, co-directing credit with Monty Montgomery. But you watch it, you're like, it's a Catherine Bigelow movie. Mm, man, fantastic yeah. stuff. Uh, it, it's funny. Um, um, I, 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 a little while ago, I, sh- I showed you a scene from 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 the little movie yes, I was yes, making, yes. which is a, like my little homage to Buster Keaton and yeah. blah, blah blah and this kind yeah. of thing. Now, a guy that I was also recognizing in that is a guy named Charlie Bowers, who's, yeah. who most people have never heard of. Yeah. Uh, in 1915, he started as an animator. And then a, a brilliant animator. He did all kinds of stuff. He was a Bronco Buster. They say he was kidnapped. All those all those guys had they, those, those, these those, wacky stories. Yeah. 
I say he, he says he was kidnapped when he was six by a traveling circus <laughs> and, and, and who, who forced him to become a tightrope walker, uh, which apparently he was. In, in, in any case, he turned his attention to live action uh, uh, the filmmaking in the very early 20s, developed all kinds of photographic processes. He's one of those inventor type guys, uh, so, so something like Georges Méliès, yeah. uh, where he could do things that would combine animation with live action again. We're talking about the teens and the twenties now, uh, and he turned. He had this little character that he played. It's called Francois, something or other. And he was so he's a very Chaplin-esque, uh, Harry Langdon. All, all of that was was where he started work. Much of his work had been thought to have been lost. His short films, these many many short films, mm -hmm. uh, many of them were, have been found, and they've been uh, uh, put into this series. Charlie Bowers, short films, 1917 to 1940, Fantastic. the extraordinary world of Charlie Bowers. And I hope this sort of brings him back to the fore a little bit. Uh, interesting guy. This is fodder for a feature film. Yeah. These guys who fall off the, who fall off the, you know. It's great. The Wonderful. And that's from Flickr Alley. Yeah, from Flickr Alley. They do a great job. Uh, I got some Blu-rays from, well, actually, I'm going to start off. I'll leave the Blu-rays to the end. I'm going to do the uh, the DVDs, uh, the DVD-Rs uh, from uh, Warner Archive here. Um, mostly, this is mostly just culty stuff. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a mix, but these are all really fun discoveries for somebody who may have, uh, interest in some of these things. They, you know, Warner Archive just goes into the archive and they find these movies that would otherwise fall between the cracks. And they, they have a lot of great libraries. They, you know, they have all the old RKO stuff. They have all the old MGM stuff. And one of the old RKO films, uh, is, uh, uh What a Blonde. Uh, you couldn't really you couldn't really do this again today, but um, he, here's look. You got I I can't even do justice to this unless we're doing video. Um, look at the taglines on that. Oh, that's that's just <laughs> all these cuties and no coupons. <laughs> all these cuties oh and no God. coupons. Uh, so yeah, look, this pigs. We this, really are. This is really a comedy tour de force for Leon Errol, who was uh, who was a good uh, comedy character actor at the time, a little bit like Jack Oakey that we mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, Leon Errol had some wonderful, wonderful performances, and um, the premise here is so stupid, but it's hysterical. So he had he, he basically he's a guy who's run because of World War II. He's run out of his gas coupons because they're rationing everything, so he no longer has his gas coupons. Um, so he and, uh, his butler, back when people had butlers, um, in order to keep the limo from running out of gas, uh, they, 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 they work up a scheme and there are, there are rules around what you can do to get coupons and how do you, and so forth. So he just doesn't want to give up his lifestyle. So, um, this winds up sort of precipitating a, a, a bizarre scheme that goes into some very, very funny areas. And the whole thing, look, it's just designed to let Leon Errol be funny and to do the shtick that he usually does, but it's still very, very fun. Uh, you also have South of Suez, which is a pretty standard adventure movie of the day. Warner Brothers made a lot of adventure movies that uh, didn't look that adventurous. They're all shot on, you know, sound stages and back lots, and nobody's going to Central America or Africa or anywhere else in these things. So anything that looks like uh, you know the wild parts of the world, it's it's not even not even close. Um, this is all about a uh, looking for a diamond in Africa, known as the Star of Africa, and uh, it's pretty much standard for the what these films were at the time. Uh, originally made by First National, and um, you know uh, if you if you like the genre, you'll probably enjoy it. Uh, but it's definitely of its genre. Uh, then real quickly, the last three here, Married Before Breakfast, is really just a great uh, performance piece for Robert Young and Florence Rice. Um, just kind of a, a two-person movie. It's, uh, this one has sort of fallen off the radar pretty substantially. I didn't realize, I, I had completely forgotten that this even existed. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it deals, uh, how do I even go into this? There's a, this deals with certainly the economics of the time, which, which involved, um, uh, spending sprees and various things like that. Uh, Robert Montgomery is also really good with Sally Eilers in Made on Broadway, which is, uh, you know, another one of these uh, backstage things that uh, people were very fond of at the time. They wanted to know what went on on Broadway and how did, you know, who are the, who are the movers and shakers behind Broadway shows. Um, it's basically what it is. It's just, uh, it's one of those backstage things and a chance to give Robert Montgomery a, uh, an opportunity to really, be really cool with another actress. And uh, then we also have 
Gangway for Tomorrow with uh, John Carradine and Robert Ryan and Margot. Um, what's funny is that Margot uh, really completely fell off the map. Margot, who went like Cher by just yeah. one name, was really a thing for a moment uh, in RKO Pictures. And, um, you know, just things changed. You know, RKO kind of ceased to, to be a major studio at a certain point, and all the stars that were... Uh, that were associated with them went away. Yeah, but uh, it's hardly remembered. Hardly remembered. It's so hard, crazy. Yeah, hardly remembered at all. Uh, anyway, this is uh, this is a, kind of a, a war effort movie. It's a little bit of a propaganda film. Uh, packs a lot of people in a in a in a bunch of different stories all together in uh, what's you know basically meant to be like an anthology that raises money for war bonds and gets people rallied for the for the war effort. Uh, and and that's perfectly fine, you know. It's uh, it's just five stories that are completely disconnected, but otherwise uh, perfectly serviceable and and a nice little war era artifact. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of quick ones here. Yeah, uh, uh, the tough ones. Uh, 1976 film from Burt Lindsay, Umberto Lindsay, who was just a terrible filmmaker who made all these really <laughs> insanely <laughs> vi- violent cops all over the uh, Italian. Violent cop films, uh, and this one is just about as violent and as nutty as you can. You can do this this angry cop after these drug dealers. It's all stereotypical, but it's a lot of fun if you're into this kind of stuff. This one comes packed with all kinds of special features, uh, and this this film itself is the uncut, unrated uh, director's uh, version uh, of the film. So check that out if you just must. I remember this movie from 1990, The Dark Side of the Moon, uh, when, when all of these movies were being made. You know, in the late, middle 80s, early 90s, all of them had to have some sort of a space element to them. It's set in 2022, and they, they, they get shot out there to space to, to, to work on some sort of a weapons platform. But they miss it, and they end up uh, uh, going to the moon and orbiting the moon and landing on the dark side of the moon, and they run into some monsters on the dark side of the moon. You could make movies like this back in the day. You could not True. make these today. No, sir. All right, we're going to end with some Warner Archive Blu-rays that are so long overdue. So let me, uh, let me first of all, I love, I love the one sheet for this. Mm. This is uh, None But the Brave, directed by, that's right, Frank Sinatra. Mm-hmm. And here's what's really, really cool about this. 1965. Um, 1965. This is a, this is such, first of all, Frank Sinatra could yeah. direct. Yeah. He, I mean, he didn't. This is the. I think this is it. I don't think he did any other films as a director. I don't think so either. Um, but he, he, he nailed it. He really nailed it. And it's a war film. It's not like a two hander or something. It's really challenging. It's a really interesting one sheet, which they chose for the art too, because he, uh, he wanted to tout the fact that it was there were two sides to the war. And even though yes, the Japanese were the enemy twenty years ago in 1965. He wanted to take a different approach, a revisionist mm. approach, like Clint Eastwood did with Westerns. Yeah. And look at that. Or even, yeah. Half the poster yeah. are the Americans yeah, with Frank yeah. Sinatra, and the other half are the Japanese actors, headlined by Patsu- uh, Tatsuya Mihashi. And uh, basically, it's the story of an American transport that crashes on a Japanese-held island. So it's a behind-enemy-lines kind of thing. But it's a really smart script, uh, written by John Twist and Katsuya Tsu- uh, Susaki, and um, Sinatra really nails it, man. Yeah, he yeah. he uh, he does a wonderful, wonderful job. There are some surprising supporting performances here: Clint Walker, Tony Bill, and Rayford Johnson uh, that you just wouldn't expect. Like, yeah. why would why would Frank Sinatra cast those guys? It's not like they were A list actors, any yeah. of them. But he makes them. Yeah. You know, they they give him great performances. Yeah. Oh yeah. I did a I did a piece for John Raby's show about directors that were one and done. Uh, yeah. You, you know, yeah. actors who were directors that were one yeah. and done. I wish I had put Frank on that because that is yeah. his only feature directors on yeah. television. But uh, it was him and Nicholson. There were you know a, a couple a who just directed one movie and tapped out. And then the last two, Corvette Summer, starring my neighbor Mark Hamill uh, and the wonderful Annie Potts. This movie doesn't get enough love. This is this is a total movie of its day. This yeah. is uh, this was uh, really a, this is quite it. Look, oh, I mean, fell in love on. with Annie Potts so hard. And and part of the problem is that Mark Hamill is coming off of Star Wars. This yeah. is 1978, and and you almost can't win. Everybody's like, oh, but you're you're not Luke Skywalker. He's an actor, man. Let him give him some room to breathe. But it was just there was too much residue. Star Wars was still in so much in everybody's consciousness. Nobody really wanted to cut him a cut him a break and let him be an actor. And it's too bad. This is a really fun movie. It's just a you know it's like an American graffiti kind of thing. Yeah. And, Hamill is terrific, and Annie Potts is wonderful, yeah. and I, you know, it's uh, it, it's a fun movie. And then we're gonna go out on the movie that is a movie for our time, Gaslight. 
When you hear people yeah. talking about yeah. gaslighting, which is a big political thing now and yeah. online, and when people yeah. troll you online, and everybody's gaslighting everybody now. Okay, it comes from this movie. Uh, that's where the idea of gaslighting originates. Once again with the great Charles Boyer, this time not as a Romanian, uh, along with Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton. Uh, what an absolutely wonderful thriller. A terrific, terrific thriller. One of the all-time greats uh, from 1944. And... Um, it, it, some of the best direction that George Cooker ever did. And George Cooker was mainly known for his women's pictures, yeah. for romantic comedies, for My Fair Lady, for Adam's Rib, things like that. But Cooker could be Hitchcockian. Yeah. And he turns the screws here, and he does a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, this one, Ingrid Bergman, her first Academy Award, yeah. very deservedly. And um, boy, is Charles Boyer creepy. He really nails it. Joseph Cotton, Cotton Dave, yeah. Dave Angela Dave Lansbury. Is, and then, uh, 18 well, years old eight, she yeah, was in this yeah, movie. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's yeah, fantastic. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an absolutely superb, superb, superb movie. Originally made by MGM, now in the Warner Brothers Library, now on Blu-ray from the Warner Archive Collection. And, folks, mm. that is it. What a whirlwind this week. All right, we are done. Uh, it is a hot summer here. We hope you go out and do something other than movies. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the summer. Mm -hmm.